This morning, if you would turn to the book of Habakkuk, one of the minor prophets, and I want to look at Habakkuk and some of the parallels. I think it'll be pretty easy to pick up uh, the world we're living in today and how the Lord was dealing with, uh, with Judah at the time. I'll read a few verses and then we're going to jump around actually uh, quite a bit. It's only three chapters, uh, but it's uh, very, very insightful. It's like you're reading today's newspaper in a way. But uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, the burden which the pro prophet Habakkuk had, or saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry unto you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous. Uh, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. We'll jump back into it when you get in, but let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, that's what we need more than ever, more than ever, Lord, in our world today. We need it individually. We need it as a body. We need it as a country. And Lord, we ask that as we just look at this book written so long ago, uh, Lord, that it is, it's almost like the paper today. We ask that you would open it up to us. And Lord, your message that you gave to Habakkuk, Lord, give it to us. It's never changed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here as we uh, look at this uh, little book, but it's, uh, it's quite insightful, as I already kind of suggested there already. We have the children of Israel at this point. Uh, they'd actually had a very good king for a while, King Josiah, up till around 609 B.C. And they'd done quite well. But his son took over and, went, and, and completely reversed course. And they very rapidly, they, they went down and were right at the door of disaster by the time here we have Habakkuk coming along and ministering. And here in chapter 1, verse 2, we, we see him, he's, Habakkuk, he's crying out to God. He's begging him to help. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou shalt not hear? Cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not say. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. There, is, uh, uh, there are uh, that raise up strife and contention. And here Habakkuk, he's tremendously, I mean, he, he's intense. He's describing the times around in which he's ministering in the world at the time there in Judah. And he describes the times as violence, iniquity, grievance or misery, spoiling, destruction, strife, contention, injustice. He's looking at the world and just wondering, how can something deteriorate so rapidly? How can it get so, so, so bad so quickly? And he's praying, he's begging, he's crying out, begging God to do something. He uses the word cry actually there twice. The first time he uses it, just kind of it means to cry very simply there when somebody would give a call, a cry out for, for help. But the second time he uses a different he Hebrew word translated cry both times, but a different word. The second time, it's an intense scream. Here we have a man who's literally there. He's screaming out in a sense to God, a very, very disturbed hard. He's, he, can't, he can't grasp what it is that's going on. He becomes more and more burdened. And he wondered why God is, it seems to be so indifferent. I mean, this, this is your people. This is your country. This, why? And you're doing nothing about it. And Habakkuk, he knows exactly why the problem is. He just doesn't leave it open. You know, it was clear. It was simple. In verse 4, he says, therefore, the law is slacked. Judgment go, never goes forth. The wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceeds. I mean, here he looks, he says, when we, the breakdown in society, society that's happened, the law slacked, as he said. Judgment doesn't go forth. The wicked says compass or surrounds, depending on your translation there, the righteous. I mean, you look here all over the country, and of course, we've seen it here with you, within your own fellowship, but all over the country, virtually every city, the righteous, when they would stand up someplace and just say what is right. And just speak. I mean, here they're, they're, they're surrounded by the wicked. All of them are out shouted. They're get out. There's no place for you here. And, and instead of the law and those in authority standing up, they'll forcibly remove somebody that's just trying to ask a legitimate righteous question. What's going on here? They don't want to hear it. And this is universal. This, is, this isn't just some local thing that's happening here. It's happening all over all over the country, and it's happening incredibly quickly. 
uh, you know, it's taken out, out of nowhere in many ways, almost it would appear. And uh, Habakkuk, he says, he's looking and explained there that these problems are caused there by leaders, as he says there, who wouldn't obey the law. And the law is either being ignored or twisted. Nobody seems to care. The court system is completely failed. It's uh, they're, they're crooked, motivated uh, by unrighteousness or whatever, but, or their own weak ways. We're not told why. But the, but the system is completely broke down. It's, it's, Habakkuk, he can't understand it. He keeps crying out to God. Or do something. Why aren't you doing nothing? And then God responds to Habakkuk in a most amazing way. Oh, he says, I, I'm, I'm way ahead of you. It, you know, I'm, 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 I've got it all under control. Verse 5, God, is, he responds. He says, look among the nations and watch. And he says, be utterly astounded, oh, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told you. Would Habakkuk, what's about to happen? You won't even believe it. I'm going to tell you, but you're going to get into trouble. You won't believe it. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, Babylonians, a bitter and a hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth and possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible. They're dreadful. Their judgment is their, uh, and their own dignity. They proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. The cavalry comes from afar. They fly as an eagle hastens to eat, and they all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like the sand. They scoff at kings. The princes uh, uh, are scorned of them. Uh, they deride uh, every stronghold, for they heap up earth in mounds and seize it, and in their mind changes, and they transgress. He commits an offense, and he attributes his power to his God. <laughs> Here God says, Yabakai, I've got your answer. I'm in control. I've got it all set up. He says, I am sending down the Chaldeans. And, and he says, I, now you, you're going to have a tough time with this thing, but just listen to me. I'm going to lay it out to you. And uh, I am at work with this thing. You know, sometimes, and then as he lays it out, God has this way where uh, he doesn't explain what he is doing as much as sometimes he just first reveals what he is doing. And then later he explains. And, and then even when he does do that, it's a very difficult thing to swallow as it, as it was even here for Habakkuk, this wonderful godly prophet of God. But here is, is it starts with the revelation. God just simply says, here it is. I'm going to lay it out for you. I'm going to let you see what it is that I am doing. And then the issue is, is can, can a person then, who, if they're really desirous to know what God's doing and why he's doing it, and they want to take the time to sit before God and wait for an explanation, God, very commonly, he does that. Unfortunately, there's many people that all they have to know is God's allowed something. And they don't like it. And then immediately, well, if that's, if, if that's who God is, and that's what God is actually behind this, and he allows it, I'm not interested in your God any longer. Where is he? I'm not impressed by him whatsoever. I'm done. But the godly person, you know, realizing, number one, God doesn't owe anybody an explanation, obviously. He does graciously do it if somebody will, will, will seek him and will sit before him, as Habakkuk did. But here, what, what God is doing in this case, it is so amazing, it is so incredible, and even unheard of as far as Habakkuk is concerned, he, he's stunned. He's taken back. I mean, here he is, you know, he, he's asking God to discipline Israel, to deal with it. There's violence, a mess, the country's a mess. You gotta come and help us. Judah's in terrible trouble. And then God says, I am, I'm going to discipline. There, what your prayer, what you're asking for, don't worry, I'm, I'm ahead of you on it. And he says, I'm going to use the Chaldeans, Babylonians. And here he describes, oh, they're terrible. They're terrible, they're dreadful, they're impetuous, they're ruthless, they're afraid of absolutely nobody. They're a law unto themselves. They're, you know, they, they, they do whatever it is that they want to. Their judgment and their dignity, it proceeds from their own heart. Whatever they want to do, whatever they want to be, they're their own authority. They have no other authority over them. They answer to nobody. There is no law. And they have absolutely no fear of anything or anybody whatsoever. And, uh, and then he lists some powerful animals to describe the Babylonians. Oh, their horses, they're swifter than leopards. And more fierce than evening wolves. That's a wolf that hasn't eaten all day long. 
And he says, and their horsemen, oh, they'll spread themselves and their horsemen. They shall come from afar and they shall fly as an eagle that hastens thee. They'll come for violence. And uh, their faces will sup up as the east wind and they'll gather the captivity as the sand. They'll just come through, grab whatever it is that they want, uh, do what they want. They'll come from afar. They're swifter than eagles. They'll come out of nowhere. They'll just boom. Where'd they come from? How'd they get here so fast? How did, how did this situation that we're living in right now happen so quickly? I mean, it's just, you know, swifter than a leopard, you know, an eagle swooping down. They kind of, their, their armies, their cavalry, their, their horses, they're swift. Where did they come from? They came from nowhere. And, you know, I mean, I'll talk about something that uh, as we have watched in our country here just in the last few years. It's like, yeah, you know, we, we look, can almost look at virtually every aspect of our society and watch a deterioration in an incredible way. And here, you know, it's interesting. I think this one of the sad things. Well, the wonderful thing as one end, we we are, I, I think, probably arguably the greatest nation in history that men has ever been able to put together. We've got uh, godly forefathers that have done uh, did, did laid out the most incredible documents and the most wonderful things. And then we have been somewhat insulated from a lot of the rest of the history. We never we didn't grow up in Babylon or Assyria or Egypt or Rome. We didn't grow up in China or India. We don't grow where a vast percentage of the world population has born and been raised. We've, we've been insulated so beautifully and on the coattails of godly people that had an incredible document for us. And, uh, and here, though, to, to, to see something swoop down seemingly so rapidly on it and have us deal with this. And Habakkuk, though, he's looking at his world and he's absolutely stunned. He can't believe it. And he realizes God's behind it there. And he's so frustrated, and, and he was frustrated immensely to start with, but now the frustration grows. And now it's the picture here, as he sees, of devastation. And what could be done? And now he, the very God that he's praying to and asking God to help and deal with it, now how do you pray to him when it appears he supports it? In fact, he's behind it. Now you really got a problem. Habakkuk sitting there, he's stunned, he's, 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 he's kind of speechless. As God has kind of described all of this, people with no authority, no fear, there's nothing powerful enough to stop them. There's no way to protect yourself, to fortify yourself. There is no defense, there is nothing there. And now you're crying out to God to help, and he says, I'm the one, I did it. You know, and Habakkuk, here he is telling God, Hey, look, we're, you know, God help us. We're backslidden. We're wicked. You know, our, our, our Judah's in trouble. Lord, you need to do something about it. And now God comes and says, I am. I am doing something about it. I'm bringing in the most wicked and perverse and corrupt and evil and heathen nation to clean up the mess. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, that's what, he, that, that's what we're reading. That's it. And, and it's incredibly amazing. It's almost like, you know, we could be looking at our countries. God, our country's in trouble. Look at anything. Pick a topic. It's just absolutely disastrous. Please, God, help us. We're backslidden. We're far from you. And God says, don't worry. I got a plan. It's exciting. I'll give you a little insight, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send a pandemic. <laughs> Which may not even be. <laughs> but we won't go there. But anyway. But I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to unloose confusion like you've never seen. I'm going to let government things, they, leaders think they are sovereign. They'll, they'll realize we got more power than we ever dreamed. And they'll abuse it. They will control society. They'll tell you you can leave your house, can't leave your house. If you can go to work, if you can go to school, if you, if you got to shut down everything, there'll be terrible losses. Losses in school, we'll shut down police departments, we'll defund the police, won't, 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 don't want you to go to church, we will sue you if you do, you know, or whatever. We'll, we're going to defund everything. We're going to let crime just go absolutely crazy. We'll shut down businesses. They will never recover. They'll never return. Oh, Habakkuk, it's exciting, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you got to you, you gotta see this. And Habakkuk, can you just imagine? He's, he's, he's trying, trying to grasp this. What a, God, wait a minute. 
I mean, what do you, how, you, maybe you heard of the, the mountain climber that he loses his footing. All of a sudden, he's holding on to a cliff. He looks down. There's a couple hundred feet fall, and he's screaming up top, hey, oh, is there anybody? Help, help, save me. There's a voice, oh, don't worry, Habakkuk, it's me. It's God, I'll save you. Oh, thank you, what do you want me to do? Let go, I'll catch you. <laughs> he hangs there for another couple minutes quietly, and he says, is anybody else up there? <laughs> I mean, you're looking, Habakkuk say, hey, is anybody else up there? Is there any, there, there's got to be somebody, this, this, is, this is incredible, this can't be. But Habakkuk, he doesn't believe it. And now the very people that he is now asking God to deal with and to correct and to judge, he now defends them. He now turns around and, 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 and he says, verse 12, he says, wait, 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 hold him just a minute. Are you not from everlasting? Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, we, we shall not die. Oh, Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. Oh, rock, you have made them for correction. You are of pure eyes to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look at those who deal so treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish in the sea? He's looking at, wait, 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 we're going to go. All right, we're a mess. We're a terrible mess. They're worse. Why would you possibly, uh, you're a righteous God. You are a holy God. And how could you possibly use somebody more wicked than we are? We're a mess. We're wicked. We're bad. We need, we need discipline. But surely, God, you can't use something so filthy, so corrupt, so evil, so wicked like that. It's, you know, you're a good God. You're, you're a wonderful God. What's going on here? But Habakkuk, you know, I think most of the time when we're praying, you know, we, we're like that. We expect, you know, God, when God does something, when God does surgery, he does it in a, in a sterile environment. Well, God, if you've ever had surgery, I mean, you, you, you know, I've had a bunch. I've had my hips replaced, my knees replaced. I've had lost a lung. I've, did, you know, I've had a shoulder replaced twice. I've had, well, the lobotomy. That was, that was the one that didn't work. But, the, but all these different things. To the, but they're all sterile. I go, you know, they wheel me in, you know, white, you know, high gloss enamel walls, all the equipment sterile, and you sit there. God looks at that. We expect this thing. Well, God, when you do something, you, it's so clean. It is so obvious. It's, it's, the, it's the great physician. God says, oh, really? I'll use a rusty ax if I want. I'll use whatever I want to to get the point across, to get through. And the Lord, for many times, he tried to get through. He tried to get through. Second Chronicles, uh, speaking of this very event, 36, 14, it says, uh, he says, Moreover, all the chief priests and the people, they transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen. And they polluted the house of the Lord, which he hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers uh, sent to them by his messengers, rising up in be times and sending uh, because he had compassion on his people. And on his dwelling place, but they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words and misused his promises until the wrath of God arose against the people till there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with a sword and so forth. It to fulfill the word of the Lord, which by the mouth of, uh, of Jeremiah until the land enjoyed her Sabbaths. Here there's something to where God looks there and in Chronicles, it's walking, you know, looking at the same picture that Habakkuk is looking at and just simply says, I sent everybody I could. I did everything. I've been speaking, 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 speaking. I've sent my prophets. I've sent my priests. I've sent my leaders. I've sent my messengers. You just despise them. You misuse them. You didn't pay any attention. No matter what it is until, as he said, there was no remedy. Therefore, I brought the Chaldeans, and I let, it, I, I let them deal with you. I let you go through the crushing experience of that to fulfill the word of the, the, of the mouth of Jeremiah. And here at the same time, you know, Jeremiah, you know, he is speaking about this and dealing with it. But, you know, it's so rapidly. I think when we look here at, at something that has occurred within our, our country, uh, you know, in the last few years, it has happened so rapidly. We think, I mean, this has got some big, big concerted uh, uh, agreement that has happened in some high places all over and people have gotten together. Uh, I don't personally believe that. 
and uh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not questioning that these things are, are happening to things, as much as I look there and say, no, God, who, who has held and had his hand so wonderfully upon this country in so many ways for so many years, that God has allowed something to happen. That God is, one, it, 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 it is behind, just like he was in Habakkuk's time. I mean, when you watch their intelligent human beings, intelligent human beings with PhDs, you know, that, that you know two or three years ago, if you would have asked them to come in and to speak before the, before the Senate and ask them, can you tell us what a woman is? <laughs> they could have told you what a woman was. And I mean, they, but, without question, they all could have. But in, in, in this, the last few years, they don't know what a woman is anymore. What is a woman? Oh. <laughs> That's a tough one, you know. <laughs> you know. All right, can a man have a baby? Yes, yeah, man can get pregnant. Wow, you guys are really smart. I never knew that before. You know, I mean, here, how does something like this happen? As if, as if there isn't something where God is just lifting their, his, what he's holding on to a society and allowing it essentially to unravel before our very eyes. Where now a boy doesn't know if he's a boy anymore. A girl doesn't, you know, no, 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 no. Your mommy told you you were a girl. Your mommy didn't let you really realize, no, this is your choice. Up the school, I live in Orange County, Southern California. Our school, local school district has just come out with it. They're, they're, uh, they have identified uh, 10 different sexual identities. 10. Five of the words I never even heard before. I mean, after really. You know, I mean, all of these new sexual identities. Where do they come from? Where is it that in massive ways has swooped down like an eagle, like a, faster than a leopard, sweeping through, you know, a, a nation all over the place? And here, you know, Jeremiah, while all these things are, are going on, you know, I, I, and, and, and Habakkuk is speaking. Habakkuk, now, after, first he goes and he's trying to say, God, you can't do this. And now he's, he actually, he's defending his people. And when that doesn't work, then Habakkuk actually goes to the place there where he argues, God, the people are helpless. Don't you understand, God, you can't do this. This is in verse 14, he says, And make us men as fish of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. And they take up all of them with the angle, and they catch them in their net, and they gather them in their drag, and therefore they rejoice and are glad. He says, God, you let the Chaldeans come. They will annihilate us. We'll be gone. Our world will cease. They'll come down and they'll just swoop us up in a net. All right, we need this. You know, but each, no matter, first, he, God deal with them. Then he says, I am. And then he says, no, God, you can't do that. that you know, that's too radical. And he says, that's too bad. I'm going to do it. And then he comes back and he says, but God, that will be total annihilation, annihilation of a society as we have ever known. It. And then God lets him sit there. Let's it go on. You know, sometimes... God, he has always seen man. I personally, I don't know that society has deteriorated in the last three years. I don't know that. I don't know if I would say that. I just don't. But I mean, what God has always seen in the heart of every man. God knows every man. I don't know that in, this three, in the last three years, people just decided to become wicked or whether they were always wicked. Only there was a society that kind of held it back. There was something there that says this is wrong. This is unacceptable. Therefore, you do it, you will be in trouble. There was a certain, when there's laws, and you know, the, you know, I happen to be a conservative. I'm a conservative not because of political issues. I'm a conservative because the Bible's conservative. The Bible gives us the law. You, and basically the assumption is, with the, with, is that if you leave man alone, he'll self-destruct. He needs laws. He needs regulation. But it doesn't do him any good until it works. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But when people don't want to go to Christ, now they don't like the law. And now we've got a lawless society where, we, where we've now thrown out laws and now people are free in their own mind to do what it was that they were restrained when there was law around. So you want to go in and strip a, you know, a department store of everything that's got or go running out with everything in it? I want to do that. You know, <laughs> I want to do that. Who doesn't want to do that in one sense? Why do they get to do that, you know, or something? 
but to realize there, there's something hopefully inside of me that says that's wrong. You don't do that, and that there's something there within there, a law, a schoolmaster, that says you don't do that. It's against God, it's against society, it's just everything that's precious. But if somebody there in their mind, they don't have that. I don't think we've become worse. The veil's just been lifted and we're seeing what God has always seen in the heart of man, the natural wickedness of a life outside of Christ. It's just that simple. And God is allowing. And here, Jeremiah, he actually tells us while all of this is happening, when you look at Chronicles and you look at Habakkuk and then you look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the whole time he's out there to explaining to people that it's filled right now that Judah is getting all these false prophets out there that telling us, don't worry. Don't worry, these things there that Habakkuk and others are fearing, whatever, God would never allow it. God is so good. He is so loving. He is so wonderful. Don't concern your little heart about anything. It's everything's going to be fine. But here for 40 years, Jeremiah warned the people. Jeremiah, you know, uh, you know, and he begged Judah to get back to God. They refused. They didn't do it for 40 years. Many, many decades ago, Billy Graham once said, if God doesn't judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. When you look at what has happened, we've been, our country, it's been going down a long time. It's been, you know, there, uh, and the issue is not, you know, it, 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 it's spiritual. And we've got to look there and realize that fundamentally, that's where it is all dealt with. Now, Habakkuk finally He's sitting there listening to this. He's run out of answers, run out of arguments, run out of defense for the things. But in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, well, I will, I'm going to stand my watch. I'm going to set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me when, uh, and I shall answer when I am reproved. All right. You know, and here's where the wise and the godly person is. Here's their response. There, there's something, I'm confused, I'm frustrated, I don't agree, I can't believe. I'm stunned beyond belief, but I know I'm wrong. And I also know God's never wrong. So he says, I'm going to go sit, I'm going to go to my tower, I'm going to sit down and wait for him to rebuke me. And then he does, wonderfully. He goes on in, uh, in chapter 2, and I, I don't have time to spend much time in it, but he lays out who the Chaldeans are. Verse 5, he says, oh, they, because they transgress by wine, they're proud men, they, they keepeth, uh, uh, neither keepeth at home, they enlarge his desires as hell, he is as death, he can't be satisfied, but he gathered unto him the nation, he heaps up all these people uh, there, they... Uh, uh, shall not, in verse, chapter 2, verse 6, all these take up a parable against him, building a proverb against him, saying, Woe unto him that increases that which is not his. And uh, verse 7, he says, They shall rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake and vex thee. Uh, in verse 8, he said, they, they spoiled many nations, the remnant of the people they spoil. Men's blood are all over the hands. Violence is in, their, is in the land because of them. Woe unto he that covet, coveteth the evil uh, conscious. And this house is set as a nest on high that he may be delivered from the evil. In other words, while he's apart and all of these evil is unleashed, there within it, there's a whole bunch of their leaders. Their nest is on high. They're above all of this thing. They're delivered from the power. What they're watching, everything else, they, you know, they got gated communities. They got their security. They're untouched by all of it. Doesn't bother them. While everything else is just completely deteriorating. And in verse 19, he says, Woe unto him that saith to the wood, an idol, an image, Awake, and to the dumb stone, arise. It shall teach, behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, but there's no breath in it at all, or in the midst of it. God looks there and he says, I, I get it. I know who they are. I know exactly who they are. They're, and their idols and their images and where they get all their strength and their power, so they suppose. And uh, all their, 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 their wickedness, their corruption. But in verse 20, he says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. God lays it out. I see all that. And he says, no, keep silence. I'm in absolute control. I know precisely what I'm doing. Habakkuk, he watches and he waits and he meditates. And oh, was it ever worth it? Chapter 2, verse 6, God says, Behold his soul, which is lifted up. It's not upright within him. I get it. I know exactly who's coming. 
But, but the just shall live by his faith. Here is something I know exactly who they are and what it's all about. And he says, but what you don't seem to understand yet, Habakkuk, is that the just, the justified, those that are mine, they will live through this by his faith. And the rest won't. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Malachites, Philistines, the Edomites, Moabites, and many others. They were nations there, you know, that they've all been around. Men, they've all gone, too. They've all come. They've all gone. But God used them for his purposes with Israel at Chimes. They've all come and they've all gone. Anybody have lunch this week with a Jebusite? <laughs> Jezurite and Amalekite, Hittite, Hivite? Now, I know we're close to Washington, so maybe you have. <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> maybe you're married to one. Maybe you are one. I don't know. The point is, is they all came. God used them for a time for his purposes, and then they're all gone. Mark Twain wrote in 1899, the Egyptian and the Babylonian and the Persian, they, they rose, they filled the planet with sound and splendor, and then they faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their tor torch high for a time, but burned out, and they sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jews saw them all. He beat them all, and now he is what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert, ag alert aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? And we know. Mark Twain didn't. We do. God says the just will live. You live through it. I'm going to do something there that's so hard and so heavy, but at the same time, when I'm done, there, I mean, you know, God, you know, before with the children of Israel, he used, I mean, he sent prophets. He gave them his word. He was loving. He was patient. He was long-suffering. Then he would follow up with famines and pestilence and natural disasters. And then when that didn't work and they still wouldn't listen, then God would use their enemies. And that always worked. As a last resort, but it always worked. And then they were removed after they worked, and the children of Israel went on. And they lived. Habakkuk 3, 6. Habakkuk, now he's learned, he's got it. And he, and he says, his ways are everlasting. The ways of God, they're everlasting. Man's ways, there's all sorts of variables and inconsistency. God's ways, is ab they're absolutely consistent. They're predictable. They're the result of incredibly wise deliberation. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that God works according to the purposes of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own goodwill. He knows exactly what he is doing. His behavior is not some knee-jerk reaction, something that you've got to do this. It's wise. And sometimes it's incredibly radical. Yesterday I had conversation with two dear, dear friends going through they've been going through all sorts of things and for some time getting worse and worse cancer issues until finally the doctors they end up doing perhaps the most radical thing you can imagine doing to a human body it's called chemotherapy it's where now you inject a pure poison into the system and it begins to eat away. It begins to, you know, it takes a, that poison, it, 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 the hair falls out, the eyes bulge out, skin draws in, weight is drawn, it lost. Organs all begin to get on the verge of failure. They bring you right up to the brink of death in order to save you. God, he has chemotherapy. Is sometimes what he'll do to a nation to bring it there to where it thinks, oh, it's this, oh, it's this, oh, it's this. Try this, so that'll work. Maybe about this. Meantime, God is looking there. I know exactly what I'm doing. In Habakkuk, he finds himself as a watchman. He finds himself now that he is there, somebody that God tells him. He says, I'm going to give you the answer. And Habakkuk, and this never changes. I don't care where your generation we're in. He says, I'm going to give you and you're going to write something down and you're going to put it there on a tablet that he that runneth by. That somebody in the quickest moment of a communication or a conversation, you read it, it'll be clear. 
The just shall live by his faith. And you know that God gives that to us. He looks at us there and here. The wonderful thing is Habakkuk, he ends up, he climbs. Nothing changed, nothing at all altered there. Only thing that happened was Habakkuk changed. He understood the economy of heaven. He realized what God was doing. He was begging for his country and here God says, I'm dealing with the country. I know precisely what I'm doing, exactly what I'm doing. I've tried everything short of it, but now, now you tell them where the chemotherapy is. You tell them where life is. You tell them where the hope is. Everyone that passes by, you're standing in the grocery store. You're down at the city council meeting. You're in the school board. You're wherever it is. Your message, Habakkuk, the just who live. And he finally gets it so clear in chapter 3, verse 17 at the end. He says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit of the vines, the labor of the olive, it shall fail, and the olive or the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. There shall be no herd in the stalls. Though nothing changes, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon high places. God wants you to go home walking on high places, above it, not in it. Not just another victim of what is going on and not just simply running back and forth with all these other things. But somebody sits there, says, God, I get the message. I get the message. And then as wherever we go, Jesus looked at you and he looked at me and the, and the ones that know this truth. Now, I mean, Jesus' is central message of history of the Bible. He looks at those that have listened to him and he says, you are the salt of the earth. The salt is lost and savor, where shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid and neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light to all that are in the house. So you let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. God looks at you and he says, you get the memo? This is who I am. Now, this is, whether he is doing this in America today, I, I don't know. I just see a lot of incredible parallels. And to me, it's very hopeful for the Christian because the Lord looks and he says, you'll be fine if you're justified, if your life is in Christ, if you belong to Jesus, you'll live, I promise you. They won't. These other things will go on, they'll pass. But you will live. And those that bear that message. So the Lord commissions you and commissions me, he says, Climb up into high places, hinds feet in high places. Enjoy in the God of your salvation. Say, Lord, you are in control. You will work. We need it. Apply the chemotherapy. <laughs> Whatever it is that needs to bring us to our knees, the revival can break out. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word, Lord. We just pray that it would be, while humanly discouraging, there's a part of us just like Habakkuk. The Lord, if this is a repeat of history, which I don't know, but I think so. But Lord, if this is, then we just pray, Lord, that we would get the whole message, not just simply, you know, look at all the world around us like any newspaper reporter can get. But Lord, that we would have climbed up into high places and looked at it from above. And there we would have a message of hope for the world. And Lord, we could look at them and say, what are you worried about? The just shall live. Are you just? Have you been justified? Do you know Christ? If you do, you will be fine if you have that faith. And without it, I have no guarantee for you. Lord, we pray that today that our hope would be in you all the way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.